hi everyone and thanks for watching this video today i am going to talk about some curiosities of the history of peru before the independence basically during the colonial times and this lecture i'm going to give you today was based in this book that well is in spanish the name of this book is historias ocultas hidden stories and it was made by a uh, Peruvian um, journalist. His name is Italo Cifuentes Aleman. If you would like to practice your Spanish, I highly, highly recommend you to buy this book. It has 200 curiosities of Peru from the periods of the colony until all the recent times, actually. So, well, I will not be able to tell you the 200 curiosities, but I'm going to share with you some in this series of two videos I'm going to be making for you. So I'm picking some of the most interesting I found uh, while reading this book. So, well, let's start. The Spaniards reported that the Incas used to have dogs with black hair and brown tail that they called Alco. So the Spaniards, well, basically uh, reported uh, to Europe about the specimens of animals that were new to them, and they were quite attracted towards the local animals, especially the perro peruano, the, um, the hairless dog, uh, this dog that has no hair, that is native of Peru, and is originally from the coast of Peru, especially from the north coast of Peru. Um, this dog has been reproduced, uh, represented in different um, art, like for example, potteries have made by pre-Hispanic societies from the north, like for example, the famous Mochica culture. Also, it was buried in some special uh, tombs that were related with, um, let's say, the elite of that time. So this was a dog that was considered to be, in some cases, very, very special and even represented a, sometimes as a deity. But there are other dogs that we had in Peru that, well, eventually were uh, extinct due to the new races of dogs that were braver, that will at some point um, mixed uh, with these uh, dogs or uh, kill these native dogs. So um, one of the varieties that is possibly the less known here in Peru, even by the own Peruvians, is the Shepherd of Chiribaya. And the Shepherd of Chiribaya is originally from the south coast of Peru. It's one of the varieties of shepherds that you can find in the world. And this is a pure breed dog. Um, so as I said before, most Peruvians don't know about this dog. Um, but about the alcohol dog, the one I was mentioning in the beginning. Um, this dog it was explained, uh, like uh, described by the Spaniards as a mid-sized dog that uh, was black and had a beige uh, tail or sort of like brownish color, light brownish color uh, tail. So these dogs, which we no longer see anymore here in Peru, we don't have like one pure breed alco dog anymore. Um, presumably, let's say they run away from the uh, from the people uh, they were escaping possibly from you know uh, the bigger Spanish dogs that arrived here and uh, we think possibly that they are running wild in the Andes during the colonial times where it created hospitals exclusive for white people black or indigenous it's really interesting to see that the idea of colorism uh, that uh, nowadays is basically something we cannot is still happening in some parts of the world um, was uh, also determinant in our uh, context uh, to uh, for example create facilities such as hospitals there were hospitals for Spaniards and those hospitals were not visited by either indigenous or black people because they were considered to be completely different and this situation continued until really not so long ago uh, remember that in peru for example the slavery was abolished in uh, the year 1854 so um well we lived until the 19th century with big big segregation 
and even the 19th century was a time of learning we were like not really accepting everybody like with open arms after the abolition of the slavery or the abolition of the indigenous tributes uh, given to um, the let's say uh, the government uh, it was um, a time uh, of you know adaptation the 19th century so well we had several several uh, hospitals uh, created of course initially for the Spaniards and later on were added hospitals for indigenous and uh, black people which um, in all of the cases of uh, the black people that came from Africa were uh, slaves also uh, they were um, put in hospitals you know only for them the first hospitals created were in 1538 the nursery for poor Spanish in 1545, Santa Ana Hospital, which was specialized in indigenous of both genders. In the year 1546, the San Bartolomé Hospital for black slaves and black free men of both genders. In 1552, San Andres Hospital for Spanish and white people born in Peru. In 1562, the Hospital of the Charity for Spanish Women. In the same year, 1562, San Lazaro for people with leprosy. In 1573, the Hospital of the Holy Spirit, Espíritu Santo, for sailors and merchants. In 1594, the St. Peter Hospital for clergymen and also for priests. And then we have in 1648, Our Lady of El Carmen for indigenous. So basically, uh, you can see the evolution of you know the hospitals here and how the service of the healthcare was given and prioritized uh, back in the colonial times. The first informs about the coca leaf were made in the year. 1551. Since the arrival of the Spanish conquistadors, they started to notice also about the diet of the local indigenous. And one of the things that trapped their attention the most was the chewing of the coca leaf. If you want to know more about the coca leaf and its properties, please watch my video dedicated to the coca leaf, which I'm going to be uh, leaving in the description of this video. So basically, the Spaniards were interested in, in this tradition. They had no idea why this was for. Um, they knew they were not eating the coca. They were just chewing this uh, leaf. So, well, initially, they were sort of like uh, very rejective with um, consuming the coca or doing what the indigenous were doing. They even were trying to uh, persuade the indigenous not to consume coca leaf. But they started to notice little by little the benefits of using the coca leaves. Um, they mentioned, for example, that they sow uh, indigenous consuming constantly this, uh, this leaf, chewing these leaves. And every time they sow an indigenous with the leaves in their mouth, they can run all day with no needs of eating anything. Uh, so uh, they noticed that it was a, sort of like an energetic, it energized the, the people, the indigenous, it sustained them the whole day. And um, well, basically because it's so rich uh, in calcium also, it was very nutritious. So uh, the uh, Spaniards, it started even to consume the coca leaf in the altitude, but not immediately after they arrived. It took them a while to understand uh, their benefits. So, well, that's why uh, uh, they even report about the benefits of this leaf to Spain in this year, 1551. In 1551, the Viceroy of Lima believed that the tapada limeña or the copper limeña women used to go below these dresses they use naked. So, well, it is really interesting to, to see this um, because, first of all, the Tapada Limeña, initially, they were um, sort of like a, a replica uh, of the 
um, Moorish women, the Arab women, that use this sort of like burqa uh, in you know, covering their, their faces, covering their hairs. And all of this trend, all of this fashion came from Spain um, because part of Spain was um, invaded by the Arabs for around 800 years. And the Arabs left in the south of Spain, the territories that were occupied by them, lots of their traditions, lots of their uh, fashion. Um, well, so basically the, the idea of you know, covering the, the, the hair of women with veils, especially the face of the women with veils, um, was something that actually came from far away uh, than just Spain. So uh, in Peru, the, the women uh, of, of Lima especially started to copy that fashion uh, that so from the Spanish women that were coming to these territories. And uh, well, this, is, this fashion proliferated quite fast. Um, there are many reports of the church asking these women of Lima from the colonial era, basically the 17th century, 18th century, and early 19th century, uh, asking them to not use the veil. And this is because there were reports of women that were leaving their houses with the veil on and doing like a lot of things that were not permitted back then. For example, you know, having boyfriends or if they were married, having lovers, uh, even men that escape from uncomfortable situations dressed up like a tapada limeña. Uh, so below that veil, it could be maybe not even a woman, it could be a man. So um, this is why uh, the church didn't like this. Um, women co covering their faces, covering their identity like this could be free back in the colonial times. And that's why uh, the church was so opposed to this. But in this period, you know, in the 16th century, the year 1551, the Viceroy Antonio de Mendoza y Pacheco, um, well, came up with this idea of banning the use of the bail, even with, you know, like seclusion in, in convents uh, for women that insisted in using these bales um, and the reason you know he the excuse he used for uh, this was very funny to me uh, he believed that women that were covering their faces their bodies like this with this veil they were naked below those bales um, well it, it could have a little bit of truth this this um, uh, belief that that happening in that time um, but not because these women were not you know like uh, you know taking care of their modesty <laughs> um, but possibly because Lima back then was still a very let, let's say not so wealthy city uh, the citizens of Lima were not all that rich they couldn't afford uh, you know the fashion from Europe they couldn't afford the clothes so maybe um, they were dressed up like not completely naked the women uh, like below these bales but maybe they had not so many clothes to use so uh, it was maybe more you know like uh, because they were <laughs> they were poor uh, and they couldn't afford clothes uh, <laughs> like too many clothes like uh, the tradition back then in the 16th century the Spanish authorities permitted the sacking the looting of tombs and religious sites of the Incas hmm? so uh, this is also another chapter uh, of the history that is really sad, the history of Peru that is really sad. And this started also, um, you know, like a series of destructions of uh, the patrimony of Peru uh, that continued until not so long legally, um, like, you know, with no limitations. Um, nowadays it's illegal, by the way, but honestly, uh, <laughs> it, it's very hard to control all of the many 
thousands of archaeological sites we have in this territory. But we used to have many, many more, and we've done an irreversible damage to these places. So, um, well, basically, the same viceroy of the idea of banning the bail of the women of Lima, Mr. Antonio uh, de Mendoza, the viceroy Antonio de Mendoza y Pacheco, um, he, well, gave granted permission to the Spaniards to sack the temples, the places of worshiping uh, of the local indigenous. Um, and, well, because it was well known that in these places there used to be lots of gold and lots of silver. Uh, so this uh, concession granted to the Spaniards continue um, until the 19th century. When the independence arrived, things changed, but not completely like so drastically. Uh, but in paper, at least, things changed. So it was uh, prohibited to, um, let's say, loot uh, archaeological sites uh, in the year 1822 by a, a person, a character that is also a quite famous infamous maybe um one day i'm going to be dedicating a video about this man um uh, bernardo monteagudo uh, he was the advisor of the liberator jose san martin the argentinian uh, liberator san martin and he's seen usually as an evil character um well basically this man was the person um that made uh, this um, formally, you know, this protection towards the archaeological sites, but it was not because he was that good-hearted, of course. Um, it, well, he did it because, in a way, uh, the government could end up winning also because he forbade it uh, that people independently could go to loot archaeological sites, but the government could do it if it was necessary or if it gave benefit to the new, you know, like um, country that was emerging. And they uh, created, San Martin especially created, the first um, national museum of archaeology. And uh, thanks to this effort, um, we have nowadays a, a wonderful collection called the Museum of Archaeology, Anthropology and History. Processions of blood were made in the year 1678 asking forgiveness to God uh, and this is because of the earthquake that happened in that year. So the processions of blood, procesiones de sangre, uh, are processions in which people um, like flagellate their bodies um, to ask forgiveness to God. Um, there are still processions like this happening in the world. I've seen in internet some places, for example, in La Rioja in Spain, still happens one uh, that you can also check in the internet. And also in the Philippines, um, in the Philippines, exists also uh, processions in which people uh, do these actions no, of cleansing and purification, um, but in public, not privately. So um, in the colonial times, the processions were something really common. Like people were always participating in processions and uh, they were not even regulated. Like uh, a church could take out, you know, like for, you know, any reason, a, an image in the streets of Lima um, and well, people will immediately join. And uh, the earthquakes were actually a good reason to, to do a procession because it was the general belief that the earthquakes were produced um, for the rage of God. No, so when we were misbehaving, uh, we were like living lives that were not according to the scriptures or what God wanted uh, from from us. So an earthquake come. So this is really interesting because the indigenous used to believe the same. <laughs> the native people of Peru before the Spaniards uh, used to believe that the earthquakes were produced by the gods. Uh, so this is why uh, they also even offer sacrifices of 
all kinds, even human sacrifices. So, uh, well, the local people back in the colonial times continue being like sort of afraid in this in this way to the earthquakes, and they used to in some cases do this extreme action. So we have here information of a specific year in which people used to flagellate their bodies, you know, until they open wounds in their in their bodies, presumably in their backs, you know, uh, during these processions. The Pope Paul III permitted the priests and nuns to buy slaves. Mm -hmm. So, well, basically, it was a common thing uh, to own slaves uh, in the colonial times. Um, but, well, in this case, the story says that he permitted, you know, you know to these people, you know, of the church to, to own uh, slaves, no? And unbelievable. And, but we have information of, for example, nuns that used to go to live in um, nunneries, like cloister nunneries with their slaves. And, uh, well, because in most of the cases, these nuns, which belong to really, really wealthy families, they have never done anything for themselves, never, ever. So um, they didn't know how to cook or how to clean. So they needed to take someone to care of them. So in the year 1780, Tupac Amaru II offered freedom to all the black slaves if his rebellion you know, became successful. So uh, Tupac Amaru II is one of the most important revolutionaries uh, uh, of the history of Peru before the actual independence of Peru. Um, so he fought for the independence of this nation before even San Martin and Bolivar were in the picture. And this is one of the earliest, if not the earliest, scream of independence uh, that existed in, in this whole entire territory uh, of the conquered, the dominated um, Spanish Americas. Um, there were other screens of freedom in different parts, but his was the most successful at some point and uh, the one that actually lasted for a long period of time and, and was very, very close to, to you know, making it uh, come true. So this rebellion actually took place in the year 1781 and it happened before the independence uh, of France for example. So uh, it was very inspirational for other independences. So Tupac Amaru II was a, a descendant of the Incan uh, lineage. You know? So he had Inca blood. I'm not talking about the indigenous, like common people, common ears. He was descendant of the Incas, the rulers, the kings. So he had a, a really a special, uh, let's say, like place uh, before the eyes of other indigenous people. And he was the rightful man to claim uh, to be a successor at some point of the of the Inca lineage. You know? If the freedom arrived. So he made sure of fighting for it. Uh, also, back then, he was actually a very important lord and he had lots of land and he had lots of wealth. Um, he lived a very, very like accommodated life, but he decided to reveal against the Spaniards. Um, the story is very long. I'm also planning to do a video about Tupac Amaro II and the uh, independence of Peru, like a little bit more explained with some you know like uh, pictures about the uh, this important process we lived in the final uh, 18th century and early 19th century so well uh, basically this person um, made something that to me is really amazing you know? he tried to create an alliance with the slaves and historically the indigenous and the slaves were not the best friends. They had complete opposed beliefs, opposed uh, characters, tempers. So they were not really like, they were like water and oil. They were not matching, blending it so well. Although we have lots of children that are uh, the children of 
indigenous and black but um you know like uh, it, culturally they didn't blend so well so um but it's, it's it's fantastic not to see that tupac amaru the uh, second offered the freedom to these slaves and um well it didn't happen actually that freedom until the mid 19th century no? because uh, when san martin came in the year 1821 and he declared the independence of Peru he offered freedom to the black people but Bolivar reestablished the um, this oppressive system of the slavery so well these are some interesting facts about the history of Peru before the independence in the next video I'm going to be sharing with you also some other interesting and hidden um, stories uh, about Peru but during the period of the independence uh, and also some more closer to the present time. So we'll hope you enjoyed this video. If you would like to uh, also follow all the content I have for you, all the different videos I have for you, please visit my uh, channel in YouTube. Uh, you can search for me looking just uh, after adventurous travel guide and my name is Vanessa Vasquez thanks so much for your support if you would like to support me with a tip uh, you can do it on PayPal or also on buy me a coffee and I'm leaving all this information the links also in the description of this video thank you so much for watching it and please share with me your thoughts about all the themes you would like me to explain in future videos Take care and bye-bye.